Welcome back to Weekend AM. Now, our next guest is one of the world's most popular authors and has sold more than 300 million books in over 97 countries. Topping bestseller lists all over the world. Nothing Ventured is Lord Ar Geoffrey Archer's latest novel. And he joins us this morning. Good morning to Good you, Good morning, Anna. We're having morning, great Lord chats Archer. during uh, the break uh, here. We don't need to find <laughs> He's given it to me in the neck for the last five minutes. <laughs> We this like you already, good. Jeffrey. Ah, you can settle in. Um, before we get to your latest book, we want to go on a little, a little journey here because at the age of 29, you became a member of Parliament. Too young. Was too it young. too young? Looking back on it, I was a member of the Greater London Council at the age of 26. I was a member of Parliament by the age of 29. I thought I would be Prime Minister by the age of 35. In fact, well. I was trying to work out which job I would do after I'd been Prime Minister. Right, no, it was yeah. too young. It, was, it, it actually badly shaped my career. I had a young man come to see me, oh, 20 years ago, sat with me and said, I want to go in the house. And I said, you're too young. Go out and do something. That was the mistake I made. He went out and did something. He worked for a bank. And his name is Sajid Javid, and he's now Chancellor of the Exchequer. Mm -hmm. And I stopped him going in at a young age. Well, was that your plan from your mid-twenties? Was politics was the, was the role well, ahead? Well, I, I saw myself as captain of the England cricket team. I do realise, Simon, the Irish don't really understand the game of cricket. Oh, and yes. You in particular, Excuse me, we have full test Irishman, starters now. Uh, Irishman captaining the World Cup team. Yes, but they exactly. Are all shouting, yes, correct. All oh, Morgan, me. God bless him. <laughs> but was that the role that you planned ahead for uh, yourself? I, pr as... I planned to be uh, captain of the England cricket team Prime Minister, and then all that went wrong. Yeah. Got it totally wrong. <laughs> Couldn't get any of that. And uh, ended up as a, a writer. But, of course, Proust said, we all end up doing the thing we're second best at. Uh, we're uh, still waiting to find out what that is in your case. <laughs> yeah, I'm down to about nine or ten now. Presenting <laughs> is definitely not really up there. He's putting the boot in, isn't uh, he? He loves wow. me. He's a fine he, actor. He says it all with love. He's a fine he actor. He does. He's yeah. sending you up, isn't Bless he? Um, um, writing then, uh, almost accidental, because you oh, wanted yes. to pay off some yeah, debts. Yes. So quite the rebel, weren't you? Well, I got into debt, which was stupidity. Uh, I got myself into £400,000 worth of debt. In, and you're talking... 45 years ago. Yes, yeah, so quite oh, significant uh, A lot sum. of money, and I thought I, I thought <clears throat> I knew I was facing bankruptcy. Thank heavens, didn't go bankrupt, and wrote my first book, Not a Penny More, Not a Penny Less. And I keep hearing that it was an instant success. It, <laughs> it sold 3,000 copies in the first year, and it made £3,000. And 3000 from 400000 no, isn't crazy. a very big dent. No. No. The real breakthrough was Cain and Abel. Yeah. Of course. Cain and Abel, now 40 years old, on its 123rd reprint. Holy moly. 32,700,000 copies. Could you ever have imagined no. the business no. that that book did? No. And I read in the paper the other day that it, 100 million people of oh, Red, Cain and Abel. And no, you could not know. I remember when they said to me, a, a lady in New York said to me, you know, this book will go straight to number one on the New York Times. And the breakthrough, funnily enough, hold your breath, was Gay Byrne in Ireland. Well, yeah. He, he interviewed me, he read the really? book, interviewed me. He on said, the Late Late Show? On the Late Late Show, 40 years ago, and he held it up and said, Cain and Abel will go to number one in every country on Earth. And he was right. And he was the first... To wow. read it what does that, and to spot what it. does that bring in term, what does that success bring and I don't mean in terms of financial and helping your debt but in terms of a writer what does that do when you sit down to write the next one well that is the problem every time you sit down Simon you say they're sitting waiting this has got to be better I would be bound to admit after 43 years 44 years of writing that I think I'm a better craftsman but it still takes me 14 drafts, every one handwritten. Is your process to get there. the same? Mm. Is, is your process essentially the same? Yes, I rise at 5 30 in the morning, I write 6 to 8, 10 to 12, 2 to 4, 6 to 8, in bed by 9 30, 10, up again at 5 30 the next morning for draft one, which will probably be 35 oh days, a two or three week break, do it again. And the book you have is the 14th. Draft. I wish there was a shortcut, and don't think at nearly 80 I wouldn't get on with a shortcut yeah. if I could, because I've now decided to write seven books in a row, possibly eight, about a young man who becomes a constable in the Metropolitan Police Force, and I am going to take him from constable 
to sergeant to inspector right through to the commissioner of the Metropolitan Police, which will take eight years if I live that <laughs> long. I love it. I have no so doubt that you will. this is Nothing Ventured. <laughs> and this is, of course, Nothing Ventured is the first it's of the first. series. He's a young man who... His father's determined he'll go to Oxford and read law and then join him in chambers at Lincoln's Inn. But he wants to become a policeman. And he joins as a constable on the beat. And I've done book one, which is nothing ventured. I've just finished book two and sent it in. So I've now got to live another five years, please! <laughs> Why does he want to become a cop? Is that explained? Yes. Does he want to change uh, the world, fix yes, the problems? Yes, no, no. It would be better if you'd read the book, Simon. <laughs> I know. The truth is, no. I, I have no, no time between commercial no, breaks. No, I know. You're under such pressure, <laughs> being an actor and front of stage. And I saw you selling newspapers in the city <laughs> last night. So I know it's tough for they you with, newspapers. with they your four cookbook. children with your four children to bring up and all He's these other... Homework, no, I he? know the problems you're he facing. Has. I know. Don't worry. So why does he want right, to be called, no, no, please? Read it if you can over the I weekend. I will. And I'll, and I'll ring you on And Monday. then report back, Simon. <laughs> <laughs> so getting back to the question, why does he want to be cop? Well, at a very early age, he's by nature a detective. At the age mm. of eight or nine in school, he catches someone stealing tuck from the school tuck shop. Ah. And they realise from then that he's destined to be a policeman, but his father is determined to stop this. But no, he wins that battle. And his sister, Grace, does go on to become a distinguished barrister. Yeah. So you see the whole family. You see the, the distinguished father, who's a QC, the, the, the Grace, uh, uh, who is the daughter, and she, father's a bit touchy about having a girl in chambers, but she's quite brilliant. And he goes on as a policeman, and at one point... They meet each other in court. Do, yeah. OK. Brilliant. I can't wait to read it now. You're selling it for me. <laughs> <laughs> you sell it very well, it has to be said. You really do, Geoffrey. Um, can we ask <clears throat> you about the government now and the omni-shambles <clears throat> that is Brexit at the moment and the UK government? Uh, Margaret Thatcher, how do you think she would handle what's going well, on Well, I had right the privilege, now? as you know, of working with Margaret Thatcher for 11 years. I don't think she would ever have allowed it to reach the referendum stage. Mm. So it's difficult to say how she would handle now because she would never have anticipated it. There's a section of people who worked with her who say she would have wanted to be a Remainer. There's a section that say she would have wanted to be Brexit. a Lever. Now, I have the same problem <clears throat> in my family. Uh, I'm a Remainer. Yes. And my wife is a Lever. And I had a letter from the former Archbishop of Canterbury last week saying, Dear Geoffrey, can I come and live with you? And can Mary come and live with Eileen? <laughs> so we're divided right across the nation. And it's a very and, serious uh, division. It is a very serious. And I've become aware this weekend of uh, the problem uh, the Taoiseach faces mm. because he has to deliver for you something that is honourable and will work for both sides and will not... Uh, harm the Good Friday Agreement. Mm -hmm. I take that very seriously indeed. And great sympathy uh, with those problems he's facing. He, as I see it, he can't make a quick decision just to please the English. Mm -hmm. That would not be wise. And so the next three weeks <clears throat> is going to be very tricky indeed. But do you think we'll get to an end of it in terms of in three weeks' time when the European Council meets the 17th and 18th? <clears throat> do you think there will be a deal put on the table? Do you think I th Boris has something in his back pocket? I think you're more likely to have uh, seven books from me over the yeah. next seven years than you're mm. likely to see. With this has been going on... I, when I entered the House at the age of 29, I was in the House when I voted in 1972 to enter mm. Europe. That's 50 years, 40 years ago. And here we are discussing whether it'll be sorted out in two and a half weeks. Yeah. Of course. The answer to your question, Simon, is no, it yeah. will not be sorted out in two and a half weeks. And, uh, Geoffrey, do you think the average punter understands the possible implications from the fallout of Brexit? How can they? Most of them aren't interested. They have other things. They're doing their jobs. I talk to people in the street who ask me about it, and I realise they're rushing off to do something. I, I'm a Westminster bubble. I'm fascinated yeah. by it every day. Yeah. I think 90% of the British people, 90% of the Irish people, couldn't honourably tell you the significance of the backstop. Mm. And that is mm. the key that Boris Johnson 
and Europe are fighting over at the moment. And frankly, it changes on a daily basis. I'm not 100% yeah. sure myself. I have to watch the morning news, read the morning papers to find out what the very latest position on the backstop is. It's so true. And um, we have less than 30 seconds left. Are England going to win the World Cup? I wouldn't say they were the favourites. You've got to beat New Zealand. If it had been three years ago, I thought Ireland were going to win. Mm. And I'm frankly shocked and disappointed mm. by them so far. But I'm not overexcited about England, but there are five teams still in there. Mm. It's a very exciting tournament. Mm. Heaven knows who could win. I, I met an Irishman yesterday at the airport who sold, told me he'd put £10 on England to win. Right. When an Irishman puts £10 yeah. on English <laughs> yeah. to win, we must be in yeah. with a chance. Have a chance like. <laughs> Let me tell sure. you, he's got 20 quid in Ireland to win with some other bookie <laughs> exactly. as well. Exactly. Nothing ventured to see it. is out now, now Geoffrey Archer. Thank mm. you very much Thank for joining you. us. Thank you for coming in. Now, after the break, we'll catch up with Laura in the Windy City. I wonder if she's met the Obamas. Probably. See you shortly.